Father, today I would ask that you would anoint your word once again and my lips as we listen to your message from your word. Amen. Over the past several weeks, we have been taking a journey to the promised land, bound for the promised land. And we are discovering the parallels between the experience of the children of Israel and their journey to the promised land with our modern day journey to the heavenly promised land. Over the past several weeks since we began that sermon series, we have started with the birth of Moses and God, seeing God's miraculous hand in that whole process of raising Moses up in a, as a leader and the, and the challenges that he faced and, and being raised in Pharaoh's court and then his 40 years in the wilderness that God used to prepare him for actually uh, going to initiate the exodus before Pharaoh. We saw the showdown that Moses and Aaron had with Pharaoh in his court. We saw the ten plagues that fell on Egypt. We saw the ultimate deliverance of God's people and the miraculous parting of the Red Sea as they journeyed uh, with, with, with uh, uh, incredible anxiety. Great despair as they saw the sea in front of them and and, and, and the Egyptians hot on their tail behind them and the mountains surrounding them and, and wondering how they were ever going to make it. And yet God parted the Red Sea and they came through on dry land and they stood there and watched as the sea came together and destroyed all of the Egyptians, including Pharaoh himself. Now, I don't know about you folks, but I don't view these stories as fairy tales. Uh, archaeological evidence indicates that these are real stories, that they've really happened. And, and here's the thing, folks. If God could do that for his people on their journey to the promised land, what can he do for us today? And I want to tell you that these stories are deeply inspiring to me as I face challenges in my own personal life and my own personal leadership. I shared with you earlier, probably one of the greatest challenges that I've dealt with over the past several months is what we're doing with our school. Who's going to be our leader? Who's going to be our principal? And yet, you know what? God has brought me to the place, I have stressed out so much about it, God has brought me to the place that he's just said, hey, Phil, chill out. Just as God parted the Red Sea, he's going to provide us a leader for our school, amen? Just as God freed his people out of Egyptian bondage, he's going to take care of us. Just as he brought water out of the rock, as we discovered last week, he is going to take care of our needs. And that's why these stories that we read in the book of Exodus are so important for us today as they parallel our heavenly journey to the promised land. And so today, we're going to take a look at another aspect, another teaching and, and in, in, the, uh, in this journey. We're going to take a look at a teaching from the last half of the, uh, of the 17th chapter of the book of Exodus. In fact, I'm going to invite you uh, to open your Bibles to that or bring it up on your device. We're going to take a look at this story um, that actually has kind of a common theme through it. Actually, a couple of different stories, but they have a common theme. Ex uh, Exodus chapter 17, beginning with verse 8, and proceeding all the way to the end of chapter 18. Our teaching today reveals the tendency of Moses to take an individualistic approach to leadership as opposed to a more collaborative community-based approach to leadership. So let's hit the rewind button and see what brought Moses to this place. I mean, there's no question about the fact that Moses was called to be the leader. God chose him. God raised him up. But there are certain things about Moses and his leadership that God was trying to shape as God was preparing him to lead Israel to the promised land. So let's hit the rewind button for a minute, and let's go back to Exodus chapter 2. I want you to see something. Exodus chapter 2, it, it, it's, it's in the early days of Moses. He is uh, in the courts of Pharaoh. Um, he is 
uh, he is the adopted son of the princess of, of, uh, of Egypt. And so here he is in this environment, and, and he's kind of caught between a rock and a hard place. He knows that God is calling him to lead his people, and he sees his fellow Israelites suffering, and yet um, Moses himself is very pampered in the courts of Pharaoh. But notice what happens here in Exodus chapter 2, beginning with uh, verse 11, and we're going to take a look at verse 11 and 12. It says, Now it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he looked at their burdens, that he went out to his brethren and he looked at their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and that. And when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Moses believes knows that God has called him uh, into leadership. And yet here we have an example of this individualistic approach that Moses is taking to leadership. It's kind of a take it in my own hand sort of a thing. God needs my help. God can't do this without me. And, and, and so what Moses does is, 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 he, is he takes the matter into his own hands as he sees one of... Uh, uh, as he sees this situation with this Egyptian beating some of his fellow Israelites, uh, he goes and he, and, and he kills the Egyptian. He takes matters into his own hands. God takes Moses, as a result of that, into the wilderness for 40 years to teach him. And even when God releases Moses to go to Pharaoh and to initiate the Exodus, he's still teaching Moses about leadership. You see, Moses didn't emerge after 40 years in the wilderness with his act totally together. It wasn't how, you know, after Moses had, had been schooled by, by, by God in the wilderness that somehow he had this certificate uh, or this diploma of completion and he was ready, out, ready to go out and conquer uh, Pharaoh and the Egyptians. You know, that isn't the way it works. I mean, even in our own educational system, when somebody goes uh, through... Uh, through school and, and, and graduates from college and whatnot, they may have a diploma that says they've got a degree in business or whatever else, but that doesn't mean that they've suddenly become an expert. I mean, I learned that my own self <laughs> in my ministry. After I graduated with an undergraduate degree in theology and, and a master's degree uh, from Andrews University, I didn't emerge from that suddenly knowing everything and being able to handle every situation. And that was the same way with Moses. God began that training process, but there were many things that he was going to learn in the school of hard knocks. As the children of Israel were on their journey bound for the promised land, God was teaching Moses as much as he was teaching them. And so now we come to Exodus chapter 17, Immediately after God took care of the Israelites and their thirst by making water come out of the rock, they encounter another challenge. And let's take a look at it. Exodus chapter 17, beginning with verse 8. It says, Now Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Now, who were these Amalekite people? Amalek was actually a descendant of Esau. You remember Jacob's elder brother, Esau? And so from that perspective, these Amalekites were actually relatives of the Israelites. But the animosity that had existed between uh, Esau and, and, and Jacob had been passed down through the generations, and, 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 and the Amalekites were not followers of God even though they were descendants of Isaac and Abraham, they were not followers of God. And so they saw these Israelites passing through the land there, and they think, thinking, you know, hey, with all these people, two million people passing through the land, what a great opportunity, man. Just think of all the stuff we can get. You remember how when uh, the Israelites left uh, Egypt, the Exodus, the story is recorded there that that the Egyptian people were so excited about finally seeing the Israelites go and, 
and with, with all of these plagues that have fallen on, that they were giving much of their household belongings. I mean, treasures, gold, silver, all kinds of stuff that they gave to the Israelites. So can you imagine all of these Israelites as they're journeying through on their way to the promised land? Um, these guys are a mobile bank. I mean, they're wealthy. They've got all kind of stuff. And, and the Amalekites see this, and they say, wow, what a great opportunity we have here to, to, to get all kinds of treasure. But, but the Amalekites were clever, and, and you find this not only here in Exodus chapter 16, but in other books of the Pentateuch that record about this. The Amalekites, you know, didn't go to the head of the line and say, okay, let's take out Moses first. They were too smart for that. So what they did is they developed a strategy to watch and pray on all of the stragglers, the elderly, those who were feeble, that were infirm, that maybe were at the end of the line, those who were not up at the, at the front of the line with all the others, and so they were lagging behind, and, 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 and they sit in ambush, and they wait, and they start taking these people out. Well, word comes to Moses up at the, up at the head of the line. And Moses uh, says, hey, we've got to do something about it. Let's notice what happens now. And Moses said to Joshua, choose us some men and go out, fight and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it was so when Moses held up his hands, that Israel prevailed, and when he let down his hands, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. And the hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with, their, with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in the book and recount it, in the hearing of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called its name, The Lord is my banner. For he said, Because the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So here we have the story. Moses gives the command to Joshua, Hey, listen, we're not going to let these Amalekites... Uh, you know, have the day. I realize that we're not trained for war, but Joshua, I'm going to ask you to go to each of the ten tribes, and I'm going to ask you to find uh, able-bodied men there that can go and take on the Amalekites, and that's what they did, and, 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 and Moses gives Joshua these instructions. By the way, this is the first time that Joshua is introduced uh, into the story of Israel, and it's from this point on that Joshua becomes uh, one of the significant leaders and ultimately took Moses' place uh, in the whole process of leading uh, the people. But, but this, is Joseph, this is Joshua's opportunity now. So he assembles these warriors of, 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 uh, of uh, untrained warriors, I might add, of Israel, and they go, as the Bible says, to take on the Amalekites. And it's interesting to hear what Moses says. He says, I will go up to the mountain." And he says, I will take the rod of God. You remember that same rod that uh, he had used many times in front of Pharaoh, the one he threw down that became a snake, the one that he used to uh, touch the Nile when it turned to blood, the one that he uh, used in the sand and stirred up the dust that created flies and gnats, the one that he used to part the Red Sea. It was this same rod that Moses takes, and he's standing up on this hill overlooking the battlefield. Now, one thing that I, I find very interesting in the story here is Moses gives a very direct command to Joshua to engage in this battle. But nowhere do you see an invitation that Moses gives to Aaron and Hur to accompany him to the top of the mountain. They just do it. They follow Moses to the top of the mountain. And as we uh, read from the story, it turned out to be something that was key and vital and very important. <clears throat> so notice what happens now. 
Exodus chapter 17 and verse 11. Moses is holding up his hands. And by the way, folks, have you ever tried to hold up your hands for an extended period of time? I don't know how much uh, the rod of, of, that Moses had weighed. I can't imagine it was, a, it was a very heavy instrument, but still it was. You know, he was holding it up. And can you imagine? You know, just try to do that, folks. Hold your hands up. for uh, Try to hold your hands up for an extended period of time. And they're going to become weary. They're going to become tired. What's going to happen? It's going to slowly but surely come down, down, down. And that's what happened with Moses. So finally his hands fell down his side. And something that was noticed was any time Moses' hands would fall to his side, the Amalekites would become victorious over the Israelites. But once he shot his hands back up, the tide would turn and Israel was in hot pursuit of the Amalekites. And this continued on for some time until, notice what happened. Verse 11 says that there was some intervention. The, 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 uh, the, the, the section there after uh, verse 11 says that there was some intervention by Aaron and her. I, I, I'm going to tell you something, folks, that I, I see here in the passage. You remember how we took a look at Exodus chapter 2 and, and Moses was demonstrating a very individualistic approach to leadership? This tends to be the tendency, the characteristic of Moses, to very much take charge and, and, and do it sort of person, just like he decided to take things into his hand and kill that Egyptian when he saw them beating up on, on his fellow Israelites. He took him out. And now he goes up to the top of the mountain by himself. He didn't invite Aaron and her, but he goes up there by himself, and he's lifting his hands, which, by the way, uh, throughout Scripture is a symbol of, of um, submission to God. It's a symbol of, of, of prayer and supplication to God. And here he is, he's doing that. And, and as I said, his hands become weary and, and they begin to drop. But even though Moses has a very individualistic style of leadership, and his hands begin to drop, and the b battle uh, begins to turn in favor of the Amalekites, Something happens because Aaron and her move in in a collaborative community approach to leadership, and they say, we're going to help Moses. They immediately see what happens, and so they begin to get some rocks, and, and, and I don't know what it was like, but maybe they're propping the rocks up underneath Moses' arms, and, and it says that Aaron is holding one of his arms, and her is holding the other, and they're just holding them there. And they held them there until the sun went down, and Joshua defeated the Amalekites. Moses was given a demonstration of a collaborative community style of leadership with what Aaron and her did to lift up the arms of their leader. Um, but Moses hadn't yet learned what he needed to learn about leadership. It, there was much that we could say about that whole approach, and I would hope that you would be willing to connect the dots and think about what you can do to support and to lift up the hands of your spiritual leaders. But you see, it wasn't just about Aaron and her. It was about Moses, and it was about them working in community that made it happen. Because Moses couldn't have held his hands up by himself. It took that community of leadership. And so now we move on to Exodus chapter 18, and we discover the story that unfolds in Exodus chapter 18. And let's take a look at it. Exodus chapter 18. It says, verse 1, And Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Then Jethro's, uh, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, 
after he had sent her back. You remember, uh, uh, they started the journey. He took um, Sipporah and his two children, his two sons, and they were going to go to Egypt. And then um, there was a great encounter, and, and, and Moses felt, okay, this isn't safe. And he sends, um, he sends Zipporah and his two sons back to Midian, to his father-in-law Jethro. But now, it's safe. Jethro hears about the success of Israel and about the victories that God has given. And it says that he took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back, with her two sons, of whom the name of one was Gershom. For he said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. And the name of the other was Eliezer. For he said, the God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness, where he was encamped at the mountain of God. Now he had said to Moses, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and your two sons with her. So Moses went out to meet his father-in-law. I want you to notice verse 7 very carefully. Moses went out to meet his father-in-law, bowed down and kissed him, and they asked each other about their well-being and they went into the tent. Now, I read that passage of Scripture, and I had a serious problem with that. I'm thinking that Moses doesn't need to only learn about leadership. He needs to learn some things about romance. I mean, seriously, folks, he kisses his father-in-law, and he doesn't kiss his wife and his sons. Now, maybe that happened, but the text doesn't say it. You know, when Pastor Jan and I lived in the South, they had a saying, when you would do something that they didn't think was correct. They would say, you ain't right. And so I think we could say to Moses here, Moses, you ain't right. You kiss your father-in-law and you go into the tent with him and you don't do that with your wife and your sons. Well, whatever, folks. I think it's indicative of some of the ancient Near Eastern culture that he was living in uh, in the time. But uh, suffice it to say, here he is now. And, 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 and Moses is conveying to Jethro, the incredible stories of deliverance. And it tells about that. Moses told his father-in-law, all, verse 8, that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake and the hardships that had come upon them in the way and how the Lord had delivered them. Told them all about the ten plagues. Told them about the parting of the Red Sea. Told them about water from the rock. Told them about all this kind of stuff, how God had brought manna and had brought quail for them to eat. Told them all the stories. And Jethro rejoiced, verse 9, for all the good which the Lord had done for Israel, whom he had delivered out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of the Pharaoh, and who has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods, for in the very thing in which they behaved proudly, he was above them. Now, some people, some Bible commentators look at this and they say, now, that, that Jethro says, now I know. Um, it, it's really merely an expression of validating what he already knew. You see, Jethro was the priest of Midian, and he was a follower of God. He was not uh, foreign to Yahweh God. He was monotheistic, not polytheistic. He understood about a relationship with God, and he's rejoicing, and he's saying, yes, Yes, Moses, this further validates the conclusions that I have that Yahweh God is the only God. And so it goes on to say that together they, they have a burnt offering. They have this great celebration of sacrifice and, and, and lifting praise and glory to God for his deliverance and all that they've done. And, and when this is over, when this is over now, um, Jethro, the next day, is, is sitting there with his son-in-law Moses, and he, and he observes what Moses is doing. And let's take a look at that, beginning with verse 13. And so it was on the next day that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood before Moses from morning until evening. So when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he had done, did for the people, he said, What is this thing that you are doing for the people? Why do you, why do you alone sit... Um, and all the people stand before you from morning until evening. And Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a difficulty, they come to me. 
I judge between one and another, and I make known the statutes of God and his laws. So Moses' father-in-law said to him, The thing that you do is not good. Wow. Jethro is, is, is sitting there, and he's giving this play-by-play -play analysis of what's transpiring. He says, hey, listen, Moses, I hear what you say, but it's not good. And listen to what he says. Verse 18, both you and these people, both you and these people who are with you will surely wear yourselves out. For this thing is too much for you. You are not able to perform it by yourself. I think it's interesting that uh, Jethro isn't telling Moses, hey, listen, you're going to wear yourself out. He says, you and the people will wear yourself out. This, the, what you're doing, Moses, is not sustainable. I know that you've been into this only, you know, perhaps a few months at this point in time. I don't know how long it had been since they uh, left Egypt. Uh, but he's saying, listen, man, you, this is not sustainable. You cannot continue to practice this. You will bring disaster to yourself. You will wear yourself out, and the people will be worn out as well. And then he commences to share a strategy with them, a strategy of leadership that is not this individualistic approach that Moses had been used to practicing, but a collaborative community approach to leadership. And he lays that out in the, in the following verses, and he talks to them about how he needs to set up strategies where he has rulers over a thousand and rulers over hundreds and rulers over, over various other groups until he's got rulers over tens. Moses had just brought Israel out of Egypt on the journey to the Promised Land. They crossed the Red Sea. They would experienced all of these miracles and God's deliverance. And now God was doing some incredible stuff through Moses, but there were still four things that were missing in Moses' life. Three of them were Moses' wife and his two sons. And now there's this glad reunion between Jethro and Zipporah and Gershom and Eliezer with Moses I said four things were missing, and all four things were restored by Jethro. The first were obviously the family of Moses, but what was the fourth item? The fourth item was an understanding, an appropriate understanding of collaborative, co collaborative community leadership. Think about it, folks. Moses was dealing with more than two million people you know, I can't even imagine dealing with a group of people the size of the city of Simi Valley. We're talking 130,000 people. I mean, I can't even imagine taking 130,000 people out of Simi Valley and marching up to the high desert through Mojave and up that way. I can't imagine what that would be like. And Moses was dealing with two million people. And so now Jethro sees what he's doing in his style of leadership, and he says, man, something's got to change. He gives, he gives counsel to, to, to Moses, and he says, this isn't prudent. What you're doing is not sustainable. You've got to change. And so he said, he, he actually tells him what you're doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you, and you cannot handle it alone. So camped at the base of Sinai, Jethro observes this individualistic leadership style of Moses, and he rebukes him for thinking that he can lead Israel alone. And as a result of Jethro's advice, a community of Hebrews is formed into a structure that supports a shared model of leadership where hundreds if not thousands, were drafted into leadership positions. Now Moses is sharing leadership with his community by relinquishing control and trusting in the community to lead itself, but not on his own initiative. The community collaborative model was imposed upon his tendency to trust himself apart from community. So that's what happened. 
Moses set up this structure, and, 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 and the Israelites began to function much more effectively. So let me ask some questions as we're drawing this to a conclusion. What are the applications that we can learn? Well, number one, when leadership becomes a solo act, burnout happens. When leadership becomes a solo act, burnout happens. Now, I'm going to tell you this, folks. Many of you know that I've experienced this firsthand. I think we were all naive back in March of 2020 when the pandemic struck. I know I'm not alone. I've talked to many pastoral colleagues and other church leaders. I think, uh, and, 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 and many of you, we had our head in the sand about how long this thing was going to last. You know, two weeks, three weeks, a month, a couple of months. Some of the things that we did in the church during that period of time, um, I honestly felt were good things to do. I had helped hold the church family together. But I will tell you folks, I soon became aware of the fact that it was not sustainable for me. And I found myself working harder than I've ever worked before in my life. And many of you know that I finally came in, in May, I finally came to the place where I admitted and had a conversation with our conference leaders uh, that I'd actually come to the place of burnout. Now, that's not something I'm proud of saying, but it's true, it happened. Because I was trying to follow a solo individual, uh, individualistic approach to, to leadership. And in some respects, while I bear responsibility for that, folks, in some respects, the pandemic kind of forced us into that. Because we could not be in community the way we had been in community. And so we were all working off the map. We were moving into uncharted territory. We were, we were navigating in places we had never been before. Nobody knew how to do. And it took its toll. I'm thankful to God that uh, many of you were involved in, in, in seeing to it that Pastor Jan and I got some time away. And, and you know that... Uh, 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 for 10 days, Pastor Jan and I went to Hawaii, and I will tell you, I unplugged. I didn't respond to emails. I didn't respond to voicemails. I didn't respond to text messages. I unplugged, and I needed to. And while I say it, while I want to tell you it did a significant amount to recharge my battery, my battery isn't completely charged. But these kinds of things, these kinds of stories from the Exodus, they aren't an indictment to you. They're an indictment to all of us, myself included. In their book, Personality Type and Religious Leadership, clergymen Oswald and Kroger make this observation. They says, quote, research indicates that one of every five clergy is severely burned out. A key contributing factor is the expectation that clergy be competent in all areas of ministry. It isn't scriptural or even reasonable, yet the expectation continues. We need to put a stop to the prevalent belief that clergy must be com uh, competent at everything. It it's the misunderstanding of that passage of scripture where Paul says, I have become all things to all people. Application number two, effective leadership is modeled biblically in community. And if you have any question about that, just take a look at the Godhead, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, working in community. The best leadership style is a collaborative approach, community approach. And you take a look at Acts chapter 6 in the early Christian church. You remember when the, when the leaders of the church were trying to do all the work themselves and, and they were waiting on tables and they were trying to minister the word and they were preaching and they were doing all this kind of stuff and, and they soon discovered that it was wearing them out and what did they do? Acts chapter 6 we find the introduction of deacons and other spiritual leaders in the church to give the spiritual leaders of the church opportunity to be involved in ministry the way God had called them to be in ministry. And the apostle Peter appealed to the, uh, to the Christian church uh, that they were now a part of the priesthood of all believers. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, a, a passage of scripture I'm sure you're all familiar with. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Number one, 
When leadership becomes a solo act, burnout happens. Number two, effective leadership is modeled biblically in community. And number three, a question. So what could and what should happen? And how this should look in our church community. Many of you got a letter that I sent out to leaders in the church back um, the end of May, early June, to just let you know that I was to the place where um, I was severely burned out. And, and I'm going to tell you that uh, the response to that letter was absolutely astounding. Uh, many of you just stepped up and said, Pastor, what, you know, I'm, I'm here to do this. They saw the list of things that needed to be done and said, I'm ready to do it, and I thank God for that. And I share with you this question. I, I think that most of us understand that, the need to work in community. You know, if I stepped over here to the piano, and if Pastor Jan came up and joined me, and you folks watched as Pastor Jan and I started to move the piano over and attempted to put the piano on the floor, what would happen? What do you think would happen? Talk to me. Okay, yeah, we might drop it. We might kill ourselves. But what do you think? If people are standing there and they're watching, they're saying, okay, the pastors are obviously trying to move the piano to the floor. What do I need to do? What would happen? Yeah, some people would get up and say, well, come on, we better go help them. They can't do this by themselves. Folks, that's the way we need to approach every aspect of ministry. We are in community. We are a part of the priesthood of all believers. And as I thought about how this would take shape, and I've been, I've been cogitating on this message for the last few weeks, God did something amazing this week. On Sunday evening, uh, Pastor Jan received a phone call. And I could only hear one side of the conversation, but she was obviously excited, and she said, oh, yeah, you know, man, we are so excited that you're in the area, and sure, we want to see you. Why don't you come over tomorrow, Monday morning, and have breakfast with us? She hung up the phone, and she told me, she says, you wouldn't believe who's coming, and she told us about some friends of ours that we have known for a number of years in Washington State. I'll tell you who, who uh, these people are. Many of you will know them. Um, Harold and Duana Richards. Harold Richards is uh, probably better known as HMS Richards III. He is the grandson of Elder HMS Richards and the son of Elder HMS Richards Jr. And Harold and Duana have been longtime friends of ours. Uh, he taught our son Anthony in fifth grade at Buena Vista Adventist Elementary School in Auburn, Washington. Uh, they lived just down the street from us uh, for the uh, five years, four years, I guess it was, that we lived in, in Auburn, Washington, when Pastor Jan was uh, an associate pastor at the Auburn Academy Church. They were very dear friends, but we haven't connected with them in some time. Well, uh, just before the pandemic, uh, I guess it was the fall of, of 2020, uh, Harold retired from his teaching career in Adventist elementary teaching. And um, uh, Dewana also retired. And um, they came down here to Southern California last weekend. They had a family funeral up in Bakersfield. And then they remembered that we were living in the area. And so they reached out to us on Sunday evening and, and said, hey, can we see you? And so they came over for breakfast. And here's what happened in the context of that. And how that, that uh, encounter that we had with them plays in to this message this morning. Because I was trying to find, you know, what are some practical applications that I can see? And here's what they told me. I didn't tell them about what I was preaching. They were started telling us about what they've decided to do in their retirement. It said, listen, man, we're not ready to just, you know, roll over and play dead in retirement. We want to be active. We want to do things for the cause of God. And so they shared with us something really exciting that they've initiated in their church. They initiated. They made it completely clear that it was not something that the church board asked them to do, that the church nominating committee asked them to do, that the pastoral staff asked them to do. They came up with this idea and plan after they prayed about, God, how do you want to use us? And they set up a strategy where they have, have come up with a special visitation ministry in the church where the two of them, 
have actually enlisted the help of other people, and they said that even during the pandemic, they were going out and making porch visits with people. And then they would make a little report, and they would submit that report back to the pastoral staff and say, hey, we want you to know that we went and visited John and, and Jane Doe, and uh, we had a lovely time. Here's just a little report of that visit. We prayed with them, and you may want to be aware that, uh, that Jane's aunt is, is uh, suffering from cancer right now and needs to have prayer. They do that, and they do that on a regular basis, and they, they, they have developed, uh, they said they put together a little cookie mix that gives them an excuse to go to people's house. Hey, we just wanted to drop off this cookie mix to you and have this visit with you. I was so moved by how God is using them and what it is doing in the life of the church. Folks, I want to tell you that is an example of a collaborative style of leadership. That's an example of the, uh, the church working in community in the context of the priesthood of all believers. So here's the question, folks. What will you do? What will we do? We can't do ministry and finish the work of spreading the gospel by ourselves. It's not a solo act. It's meant to be collaborative. Are we ready and willing to respond to the advice of Jethro? And so I invite you folks, I want to challenge you, just like my friends Harold and Dewana Richards did, to get on your knees and to pray and say, God, how do you want to use me to be involved in a collaborative style of ministry that's going to build up the body of Christ? How can we be in a situation where, like Aaron and her, we're lifting up the hands of spiritual leadership to make sure that the battle is won? And so I invite you to pray about that in your life and how God will use you. Folks, it shouldn't be something from the top down. It should be something from the heart that the Holy Spirit is convicting you to do. It should be something that you wrestle with God on the anvil of prayer. Are you ready to do what God wants you to do? Are you ready to go where God wants you to go? Think about it, folks. Think about it. And think about it as you listen to this song performed by Fountain View Academy. I'll go where you want me to go.
Father God, may that be the prayer of our hearts. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do, Lord. May we all seek to work in community in a way that's going to build up the body of Christ and advance the gospel of Jesus to a world that so much needs to hear it. So, Lord, we just ask and pray that you would bless us now as we leave this house of worship, draw us close to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.